all of our speakers from this last session uh, back up onto the screen so that we if you can stop sharing for me as well fantastic and we'll invite any questions so um please do uh please do raise your questions um should you wish to um i mean i think we've we've listened to a, a, a number of phenomenal talks that have walked us through such a huge spectrum both across the clinical landscape and the kind of patient perspective landscape as well um and i think every every single talk has kind of highlighted key aspects um so I guess uh, I guess whilst everyone thinks about their their potential questions, um, if we uh, go back a little bit, perhaps Amrit, I could ask you a, a question. So you mentioned about um, the role of Titan in, say, peripartum cardiomyopathy, for example, um, and alcohol related cardiomyopathy. Um, who do you think we should test with in that cohort of patients? Because you mentioned considering genetic testing in those presenting with myocarditis in whom um, there was either a family history or someone with, say, relapsing and remitting myocarditis. Do you think we should be considering genetic testing in peripartum cardiomyopathy, for example, or perhaps in those in whom there is not um, improvement or resolution of LV function after delivery of the child? What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. I think the overall threshold for offering genetic testing will inevitably come down, you know, as the years go on. I think at the moment the bar is set quite high. Um, I think if if we do have uh, a patient with peripartum cardiomyopathy and we have the ability to offer genetic testing, that will be helpful. Um, I think within myocarditis, as I mentioned, I think if there's a family history of myocarditis or any cardiomyopathy in general, I mean, this last case we just spoke about, that's a fantastic case and, you know, very much highlights very much what I spoke about. So the patient was initially thought to just have myocarditis, but really had a cardiomyopathy underlying all of that. I mean, genetics there would have been extremely, was extremely enlightening. So yeah, I think as, as time passes, we will hopefully move to a position where genetics will become a lot more commonplace. And I think that will really help us. Absolutely, absolutely. Another thought that I had actually um, almost kind of changed intact from the survey that uh, that Joel and you, you kind of raised and uh, Catherine earlier. Um, how do we how do we get better buy in uh, across ICC services in the UK um, to to both ensure that we try and do better from the patient perspective, because that's ultimately the reason that we're here. Um, and how do we I guess, how do we try and ensure equity of access, equity to the expertise that people require? Should we be standardising our pathways or having a central kind of um, assessment criteria almost? Um, or for example, from the patient experience, should we have I don't know, three specific questions or three specific key points that we need to ensure that we address for each individual as they come through our service, perhaps through the use of our specialist nurses, mindful of pressures on clinic time and things. But what are your thoughts? I mean, what are your thoughts on how we can deliver that in a more seamless, equitable way? That's quite a lot there. <laughs> there is a lot there. Um, to jump in. Um, uh, should we have um, the same pathways across the country? Realistically, I don't think that's ever going to work. Um, I I think um, every, uh, my understanding, and, and I'm not a healthcare professional by background, is is just the um, standardised pathways. Just just uh, because the existing system is is so diverse, it's, it's just such a long way to get to, um, and generally. Um, different things work in different areas as well you know you've got different populations um so um what, what should ICC clinics be doing or asking mean, one thing that I would love to see um ICC clinics sort of really focusing on is um making sure that the care is really personalized you know what I was saying about the care plans having that personalized tailored approach and making sure that the patient really is at the center of their care um, that they are really empowered, that they get information in the format or language or whatever it is that they need, that they understand that they can make decisions about their care. I think um, there's not always, particularly when we're talking about underserved and marginalised communities, people don't always have that health literacy to be able to have a, a sort of a, a conversation very easily that in which they realise that it's not the doctor knows all the answers, that that they get their say as well. And I think sometimes that needs to be made really clear to people um, in language that they understand. Um, I would love uh, as well um, for there to be a real focus on um, mental health and well-being, um, asking the question, how are you doing consistently um, and making sure that those pathways are in place for when people reveal that they are struggling. 
Well, no, absolutely. I mean, there are um, the national kind of IAPT um, IAPT services that are available for psychological support. But again, it's a little bit haphazard depending on where you are. It requires it a specific avenue and either self-referral or a clinician referral um, to the services. Um, and IAPT isn't for everyone. They're, I mean, their long-term condition services, is, it's brilliant that it is a step in the right direction, but it is a little bit kind of one thing serves everything and all my, all persons and all um, all need. And, that, and obviously, we, in reality, we know that things are a bit more complex than that, for example. Um, they're not brilliant for people with neurodiverse needs, say. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, well, I think if I can just add a little bit, so I think the thing that's interesting is that um, consistency is knowing where you are in the pathway that makes it, uh, or where you are in the process, that so it's sometimes more important than what the process is. So it's, it's, it's a bit like, you know, when you're when you're phoning your, you know, the, the, the water company and your number, you're told your number 20, whatever in the in the queue, <laughs> like you're, you're annoyed that it's going to take ages, but at least you know where you are. Right. And mm -hmm. and there's an element and that's why they do it. <laughs> you know, that that's the whole psychology. So I, I think that, you know, like like Catherine says, you know, if if standardization isn't isn't achievable, you know, as a basic minimum, it needs to be you are here, you know, that this is where you are, this is what's happened to you, and this is what what should happen to next in our in our pathway or where you know where you are now. And it also occurs to me that the 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 sort of the, the, the care and treatment plan is probably the easiest fix in all of this, right? If, if you know we're not talking about restructuring services, we're not so, the the easiest fix, I think, in all of the things that our, our community are saying is that ability to to sort of write down and have that a consistent care and treatment plan. And and that just taking that that moment to say, you know, this is where you are in that process and and this is what to expect next. Absolutely. And I think the care plan, I think, is really key, too, because ultimately, if someone comes through a tertiary centre and then is discharged or, or shared care with a regional centre, the regional centre also needs to understand a care plan. So we need to work quite collaboratively across services, across patches, so to speak, and across the boundaries, both from primary, secondary and tertiary care, really, to really ensure that we speak the same conversation and that everyone knows where they stand. No, I think they're really key points. And, and that the patient knows how to get back into the system. I mean, that discussion of um, patient initiated follow up, um, I think, yes, um, bringing uh, I, I get the point that, you know, it's never going to be completely that direction, but more of that and more of the patient feeling empowered to take more, take more of an active role in their care um, and knowing, you know, what, who they can speak to um, if things change is really important. And actually, I mean, Beth and yourself and, and Jane earlier also mentioned about kind of almost direct, uh, well, it's direct to service referrals too. So I know that's a little bit haphazard across different centres at the moment. Um, so allowing, as you say, patients to get back in touch as and, as and when they need, as opposed to something specifically barring us from doing that. Um, are there any other pertinent, pertinent questions or any, any other questions that people would like to ask? Fantastic. I, I know that we've covered so much. So I, I think in the interest of time, firstly, may I thank all of the uh, presenters here. Um, I think you know we've we've had such a, a kind of privilege to have so many top line speakers providing such a wealth of knowledge on these topics. So thank you all uh, again and thank you to our speakers from the first session too. Um, so we'll move on to wrapping up uh, just in the last few minutes. So thank you again. Thank you all. So ultimately, this afternoon, I think we've learned a huge amount. Um, we've seen huge developments in treatment and science. Brian took us through the novel treatments which target underlying disease pathophysiology, um, both in HCM and DCM. And these offer huge hope in reducing disease expression, uh, disease progression, attenuating diseases, and with the hope of ultimately improving outcomes in the longer term. Um, and then Jane eloquently also took us through the role of clinical scientists and how we incorporate their advanced practice skills into clinical practice and enables capacity for services more broadly. Um, Paz highlighted that inherited conditions research is growing rapidly and actually ICCs are at the forefront of cardiac gene therapies. Um, and ultimately, we're hoping to reach a cure for these conditions in the longer run. And she touched on gene replacement therapy, direct genome editing and gene, si gene silencing therapies, which again are beginning to come into the reality. Mariana, we went through the different types of amyloidosis, the red flags, clinical investigations, uh, and, and this all hopes really to improve and transform the diagnostic pathway in the longer term. Um, Andrew highlighted the complexities in the assessment of management of hypertrabeculation and some of the guideline updates. And then Amrit highlighted the 
uh, role of myocarditis and in considering genetic uh, under basis of uh, forming the basis of some of these conditions and to be aware of hot stages of inherited cardiac conditions. And then Bethan eloquently took us through the ESC guidelines and reiterated that we do need to consider family screening and to think broadly and that we've all got work to do with regards to our pathways to try and refine who we should follow up, when we should follow them up and who can we discharge for, from our services safely to ensure that we have capacity for the wider population. And then thank you to the Cardiomyopathy UK charity team who also talked us through the results, which are absolutely critical for us ensuring that we meet the needs of our patients and we should think about our what kind of well-being and the mental uh, mental health elements towards these uh, conditions too because ultimately these conditions affect individuals and their families to a great level um, and then we've wrapped up with two fantastic cases highlighting both amyloidosis and myocarditis and actually underlying desma plaquen disease for myocarditis uh, diagnosis so Following all of those talks, I, I really do strongly thank all of our speakers um, and thank also my co-chair, Dimitra, who I'll pass over to us to finalise with the wrap up. Thank you, Dimitra. Thank you very much. Um, and I really enjoyed every bit of it. I, I wish we would have more time for questions, um, but please feel free to email any that may come up to the speakers or to us and we will forward uh, accordingly. The recordings of the previous sessions as well as this session will be available on demand in the CLIC website. Uh, we will be back in 2024, uh, and this is a threat with more educational staff. Uh, so what's the space? Um, don't forget to join the AICC annual meeting, which is taking place 23rd and 24th of November. It will be in London. 23rd of November will be National Training Day at King's College and the uh, 24th will be the annual conference at Cavendish Conference Centre. Uh, and we're hoping to see everyone there. Uh, in order to get your certifications from this session, uh, do um, take the quiz and complete the uh, feedback. And um, we're looking forward to see you in November, everyone. Thanks, everyone, and uh, have a good night. And thank you also, just on the final note, to say uh, thank you also to Rachel and to Andrea, who are in the background, who have helped us with all the technology here as well. So, no, absolutely. Thank you, Dimitra. Thank you, the speakers and the organisers for today. And looking forward to seeing you next for the next session. Bye bye.